Thank you, Liza. <laughs> thank you, Liza. I just wanted to, again, thanks, uh, th give thanks first to the Daedalus Foundation and the Archives of American Art for this fellowship opportunity, and uh, in particular wanted to thank at the Daedalus, uh, Jack Flam, Katie Rogers, and Christiana Dobrzynski. And then also at the Archives of American Art, uh, Liza Kerwin and Marisa Burgoyne for facilitating uh, my research. In assessing Robert Motherwell's early career, art historians often emphasize his artistic practices were driven by divergent intellectual concerns and creative polarities. However, the scholarly view tends to overlook the important integrated basis of his artistic and theoretical interests. And the conceptual intersections that drew him to a wide range of disciplines. A prime example is Motherwell's engagement with avant-garde American poetry and its relation to his academic training in pragmatist philosophy. An educational background he shared with such poets as Wallace Stevens, John Ashbery, and Frank O'Hara. While various scholars, most notably um, Robert Madison and Marianne Cause, have discussed Motherwell's dedicated study of American philosophy and poetry, there has been no specific examination of how these diverse and seemingly contradictory cultural forms were interconnected in his early art and thought. As a serious follower of pragmatism in the 40s, during his formative years as an artist, pragmatist poetics may have provided Motherwell with a forceful and instructive model for the experimental application of philosophical goals to modernist art forms and creative praxis. My talk will focus these issues around Motherwell's early collage works and a strong interest in the poetry of Wallace Stevens and the pragmatist ideas that underlie their literary and artistic relationship. To further narrow this topic, I will examine how Motherwell's and Stevens' mutual interest in pragmatism was narrativized in poetic and visual terms in Stevens's The Poems of Our Climate, which was published in 1942, and Motherwell's 1944 collage, Maller May Swan. I want to argue a major link between their works in the 40s was their rejection of an idealist aesthetics they associated with both the symbolist tradition and forms of non-objective abstraction, a polemical position that was conditioned by their alignment with pragmatism. Since the 1990s, there's been an active field of interdisciplinary research on the relationship between American poetics and pragmatist philosophy by such literary scholars as Richard Poirier, Stanley J. Scott, Kristen Case, and Patricia Ray. The pragmatist content of Stevenson's poetry has itself become a growing specialized area of scholarship. In addition, there's been recent publications by Mark Silverberg and Andrew Epstein on the creative inter interaction of New York School poets and visual artists in the early 1950s. Epstein scholarships give, sorry, Epstein scholarship gives particular attention to the legacy of pragmatism within the community of New York School poets, which included O'Hara, Ashbery, and James Schuler. O'Hara has especially been defined as a philosophical poet, having studied the writings of Ralph Waldo Emerson and William James at Harvard in the late 40s with a literary scholar and critic, F.O. Matheson. In a 1965 interview with Philip Pavia in the collection of the Archives of American Art, Pavia discussed his organizing of the 8th Street Art Club in 1948, a group of radical artists and writers devoted to discussions spanning a broad range of topics in aesthetics, philosophy, psychology, and the literary arts. Pavia cited the active participation of the poets O'Hara, Ashbery, and Schuler, who organized panels on the intersection of uh, poetry and the visual arts. Significantly, in defining the intellectual and discursive community of the club, Pavia also stressed the group's debt to pragmatism, stating, quote, we would be caught dead before saying we were pragmatists. But we were. We believed in experience is the real test of anything, end quote. Motherwell was a member of the club and maintained professional alliances with prominent poets in the group like O'Hara. And I just have here a, uh, just a photo portrait of Pavia. And this is a, actually a notice for a roundtable discussion um, at the club 
1951, the, where Motherwell is going to be introducing a talk by uh, Max Ernst. In tracing Stevenson's and Motherwell's backgrounds in philosophy, Stevens attended Harvard University from 1987, I'm, I'm sorry, from 1897 to 1900, where he studied with a philosopher and poet, George Santayana, who had been a student of James at Harvard. While Stevens attended the university, James published The Will to Believe, and his philosophical ideas were a dominant presence. In later years, Stevens developed a close friendship with the French philosopher Jean Wall, whose 1925 study, The Pluralist Philosophies of England and America, introduced French philosophers to pragmatism, most notably Gilles Deleuze. Throughout his career in his poetry and critical essays, Stevens often referred to philosophy in both literal and metaphorical terms. And in the early 40s, he made the provocative assertion that poetry was more effective in dealing with the philosophical than philosophy, calling philosophy, quote, the official view of being versus poetry's unofficial view. This is, a, I think, this is a, a view of Motherwell's library at the old Daedalus Foundation location. Motherwell majored in philosophy at Stanford University, where he graduated in 1937 and was first exposed to, to the pragmatist philosophy of James and John, and John Dewey, whose artist experience exerted a strong, lasting influence on his artistic thought. In 1937, he began to pursue graduate study of philosophy at Harvard until 1939, training under David W. Prawl, Arthur Lovejoy, and attending lectures by Alfred North Whitehead, whose process philosophy reinforced many of his commitments to the experiential relational concept, concepts of pragmatist aesthetics. The Daedalus Foundation archives contain inventory records of Motherwell's library compiled in 1965, which lists philosophical texts by Emerson, James, and Dewey. Motherwell's writings and transcripts of lectures from the 1940s through the 1970s contain both quoted and attributable references to these philosophers, indicating his sustained commitment to pragmatism. Motherwell had also begun um, avid study of modernist American poetry at Stanford in 1935, reading Ezra Pound, Marianne Moore, and Wallace Stevens. In the 1940s and 1950s, Motherwell shared his attraction to Stevenson's poetry with other abstract expressionist artists, including his close friend William Baziotis, and Stevenson's uh, poetic, poetic aesthetics were advocated in the panels at the 8th Street Art Club. Motherwell um, owned many of Stevenson's books of collected poems from the 1930s through the 1950s, most importantly for my talk, Parts of a World which was published in 1942. In fact, all the poems I'm gonna quote in my talk are, are actually from this text. It is also important to note that O'Hara, who had curated uh, Motherwell's retrospective exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1965, had engaged in extensive conversations with Motherwell on poetry during this period, and made the observation that, quote, the American poet most similar in sensibility to Motherwell was Wallace Stevens. And these are just, again, uh, photo portraits of uh, William James and John Dewey. Pragmatist philosophy provides a cultural background for understanding the efforts of American literary modernists to develop novel forms of language and linguistic meanings. It marked a major shift from the solipsistic ego of Cartesian dualism, in which the individual is distanced from reality and consciousness is defined by the division between mind and world, subjectivity and objectivity. In contrast, pragmatism pioneered the idea of an emergent, unitary experience based on a contextually oriented participatory consciousness. In principles of psychology and in early pragmatist writings like The Sentiment of Rationality, James proposed this new paradigm of consciousness as based on perceptions of a reality in flux. If reality itself is radically open and changing, our responses must be fallibilistic constantly in need of revision. Individual perception is conceived of as a process in time and is constituted relationally. For pragmatists, there can be no abstract conception of stable form or essential fixed meaning, only thoughts in relation that are in a constant state 
of transition. Dewey's art of experience advocated models of symbolic intelligence that highlight the perceptual revisability of perception. He promoted the experiential dynamic substance of creative works as a means to destabilize habitual forms of thought and reanimate experience, expanding the possibilities of perception. The pragmatist emphasis on transitional states of mind involves a conceptual negotiation between reality and the imagination, which drives perceptual and interpretive response. Stevens's poetry dramatizes this process. He followed James's pragmatist view on the act of nature of language versus signifying fixity. Stevens rejected structural principles that emphasize substantives, nouns, images at the expense of transitive components in a sentence, such as verbs and conjunctions, which evoke the indeterminacy of the evolving, provisional nature of perception. For example, the poem Preludes to Objects in Parts of a World meditates on achieving a perception of self directly through nature and experience as compared to the visual authority of art. The poem begins with the lines, quote, if he will be heaven after death, if, while he lives, he hears himself, sounded in music, and continues, he is what he hears and sees, and if, having nothing otherwise, he has not to go to the Louvre to behold himself. <clears throat> Excuse me. The reader is led through alternating epistemological frames, and Stevens repeatedly uses if throughout the first stanza to create an active chain of speculative thoughts to present possible shifting conditions of perception and, be and being. Other poems and parts of a world seek to register the movement of the self's perceptions through a network of things and structures in reality in which there is a complex and constantly evolving fusion of rational and imaginative elements. Landscape with Boat tracks the creative process of an ascetic painter who seeks to supplant perceptions of the physical world with his own ultimate abstract conceptions of reality and truth. The second stanza begins, quote, he brushed away the thunder, then the clouds, then the colossal illusion of heaven, yet still the sky was blue. He wanted the eye to see and not be touched by blue. In the third stanza he writes, it was not as if the truth lay where he thought, if it was nowhere else, its place had to be supposed. By rejecting what he saw, he would arrive." End quote. Stevens creates indeterminate propositional and adject adjectival phrases using as if and supposed to, su to suggest a vacillating between belief and doubt. The poem speaks to the simultaneous acknowledgement of sense data and imaginary concept and the perceptual fluctuation between these states yet it also reflects on the necessary interrelationship between the objective and the abstract imaginary as a means to refute conceptual and aesthetic certainties, what Stevens referred to as a way to, quote, search a possible for its possibleness. And finally, turning to Motherwell's art, <laughs> um, I want to consider the influence of pragmatism and the philosophical precepts of Stevens' poetry on his early collages. In this poetic paradigm, self and world, mind and object exist within a single field of action in which dynamic perceptual relations generate meaning. In comparing their works, it is inter interesting to note literary scholars have linked the elusive tone and disjunctive structure of Stevens's poetry to principles of discontinuity and collage. In the displaced table from 1943, which is here, the extreme sense of multivalence is typical of Motherwell's early collages and results from a complex mixing of disparate materials and modernist styles. An objective abstract language contrasts with a more fanciful surrealist automatism as he layered defined cutout shapes against a loosely painted ground over which are suggestive amorphous splotches of ink and gestural marks. The collage is composed of an ambiguous alternation of formal effects, in particular in opposition between planar material form 
and spatial illusionism. Like the poetic narratives of Stevens, Motherwell's collages can be viewed as a paradoxical space where there is a wavering of perception between the tactile and the optical, the concrete and the imaginary, based on an indeterminate transitional play of signs. In collages such as The Poet from 1947, the pragmatist refusal of fixed belief and the shifting between differing perceptual and associative states are also reflected in the actual making of the work. The collage images were created through a developmental open-ended open process and resulted from the interplay between deliberate methods of placing and pasting and more impulsive successive acts of tearing and ripping away. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, this is the painter from 1944. In keeping with pragmatist totalism, Stevens and Motherwell devised dialectical strategies in their works to dehabitualize and disrupt rigid dualistic theories of aesthetic perception and meaning, offering an alternative to empiric empiricist reduction or idealist ontologizing. Motherwell's 1944 essay, The Modern Painter's World, critiques the problematic distinction between objectivism and individualism in relation to the conflicting poles of surrealism and abstraction, contending that, quote, great art is never extreme. Motherwell argued the aesthetic failing of both movements was their solipsistic withdrawal to either an overly rational or subjectivist ego and the loss of a dialectical, transactional encounter with physical and social reality. His essay is written from a distinct pragmatist perspective and promotes the integrationist theories of Dewey in artist experience and even utilizes such, such specific Dewey and terminology as mind-body. As Motherwell argued, quote, the content of painting is the feeling body and mind, which is an event in reality, the interplay of a sentient being and the external world. And the reason I chose this collage is that you can see it depicts an abstract structure. Let me see if I can get this. Anyway, you can see that uh, you actually have an abstract structure that's bounded by this geometric frame that's placed next to this collage fragment, um, almost kind of maybe implying the point in the quote of the need for avant-garde art to be interconnected with what he called the external world. This is the implicit theme I want to consider in Motherwell's collage Mallarmé Swan from 1943-44, as well as his 1944 essay, Painter's Objects in which he actually quotes Stevens's The Poems of Our Climate. In referring to these works, I want to argue a pragmatist reassessment of Motherwell's and Stevens's relationship to symbolism, which is indicated both equated in negative terms with purest abstraction in the 40s. In his iconic symbolist poems, most notably um, Le Vierge, Le Vavasse et Le Belle Aujourd'hui from 1885 and Un Coup de Day from 1897, Mallarmé sought to represent the power of an autonomous imagination through a purification of language. He employed obscure anagogic metaphors and evoked moods through abstract rhythms of words, using a sense of ideal linguistic unity to create a transcendent meaning detached from the flux of time and earthly reality. Stevens's poetry has traditionally been analyzed in relationship to symbolist transformation of mundane reality through a purifying poetic imagination. However, there is a revision of scholarly trend towards a greater pragmatist interpretation of Stevenson's poetry, seeing it as exercising imaginative response, but directed towards an interactive encounter with the experiential physical world. While Stevens promoted the role of lyric imagination in poetry to abstract and reconceptualize reality, he also believed the modern poet cannot exist like Mallarmé in a self-created, idealized sphere. The po Stevens's The Poems of Our Climate marks a decisive transition in his poetry towards a pragmatist ethos and describes an aestheticized reality of crystalline purity, stating, quote, the evilly compounded vital eye 
and made it fresh in a world of white, brilliant edged. Still one would want more, one would need more, more than a world of white and snowy scents. There would still remain the never resting mind so that no one would want to escape. I'm sorry, so that one <laughs> would want to escape. The imperfect is our paradise. Scholars have argued that this description of a pristine winter landscape as symbolizing a seamless realm of, of aesthetic purity is a critical commentary on Mallarmé's use of the same poetic metaphor in La Vierge, La Vivace, et La Belle Aujourd'hui. It is also interpreted as a broader critique of the objectivist poetry of William Carlos Williams and the geometric abstraction of Mondrian. Stevens rejected both as sterile, illusory forms of beauty unmediated by a perceiving mind and lacking an emotive human content. As his poem states, quote, a never resting, transformative mind cannot operate in a perfect reality that's devoid of oppositions. Due to Motherwell's study of symbolist aesthetics in the 1930s, scholars like Bailey Van Hook and Antje Quast have argued Mallarmé Swan was created as a pictorial homage to the purest refinement and rarefied hermetic symbolism of Mallarmé's poetics, which he emulated in forming his own synthetic modernist style in the early 40s. As with Stevens, I feel Motherwell's debt to symbolism in his early art has been overstated and needs to be rethought in light of his strong alignment with pragmatist anti-idealism. So what I'm really doing is proposing a rereading of the collage as a pragmatist uh, critique of symbolist values, which are an antithetical to pragmatism, especially pragmatism, pragmatism's emphasis on what um, is sometimes called the thickness of experience, where the sensate self has a responsive engagement with the flux of physical and temporal conditions. The collage's title was likely inspired by the poem La Vierge, La Vivace et la Belle Aujourd'hui, which relates the tragic tale of a swan who does not migrate, but remains in a pond dreaming of past days, becoming frozen in the wintry landscape. The swan is an emblem of the artist immersed in idealist reverie, who attempts to construct a purified and imaginative poetic order as a form of defiance against the contingency of earthly reality. However, Mallarmé's commitment to a purely hermetic abstract ideal is unattainable, resulting in creative immobility, which is symbolized through the swan stasis and failure to transcend the material world. The collage, is, the collage does not contain a specific pictorial reference to the swan, but features an abstracted uh, figural image Um, excuse me, let me, let me start over. I'm just fooling around with, my, with the pointer here. Um, excuse me, the collage does not contain a specific pictorial reference to the swan, but features an abstracted figural image with a large ovoid form pressed against it. However, the poem's themes of earthbound stasis and lack of idealized transcendence are signified through the work's emphatic material forms and sense of structural tension. The vivid blue ground may refer to Mallarmé's 1864, 1864 poem, L'Azur, in, in which a poet rhapsodizes on the transcendental spiritual purity of the sky. Yet this ground is merely an opaque, tangible surface, which anchors the viewer within a physical, ambient space. Mallarmé's insistence on a fixed poetic order is also contradicted by the chance methods and the dichotomous structure of the collage with its random, jostling alternation of shapes and the automatist passages, which disrupt the coloristic unity of the painted support. Moreover, the hatchet shape of the figure here, um, you notice that it sort of suggests a sail, evoking a sense of vital motion and release from an idealist suspension of time. Given the work's Mallarmé and theme of wintry stasis and aesthetic failure, it is important to note that Motherwell quoted the passage I read from Stevenson's The Poems of Our Climate in his essay, Painter's Objects. He used Stevenson's metaphor of a gleaming, frigid realm for the same purpose to denounce the extreme purity 
of non-objective abstraction, its, quote, rigid, self-imposed limitations and isolation from a living world. In essays from the early 40s, Motherwell specifically extended this critique to the work of Mondrian, which he referred to as, quote, a white paradise. While he admired the Dutch master for his dedicated pursuit of abstraction, he disparaged the controlled, quote, dehumanized treatment of his pictures, the severity of his art, and its removal from the concrete realities of human existence. In the modern painter's world, he notably connected Mondrian's quest for, ex for eternal artistic purity with the aesthetic tenets of Mallarmé, indicating a similar critical ambivalence toward the poet's own white paradise, his idealist detachment and extreme aesthetic certitudes. In contrast, the pragmatist poet and artist do not make truth through autonomously willed acts but through accumulated revisions of perceptual belief, accepting the fallibility and limits of creative insight, which only leads to the possibility of ongoing artistic reflection. Thank you.